Hello, and welcome to day 101. Uh, I'm Tom Lenz and I'm back. We're here 365 days for a racial change. Uh, I'm making my, doing my own little personal project into exploring the black issue in America. 101 days, you know, I, I'm starting to come to formulate my own ideas, what direction I'm Want my life to go in, what I want people to know. Um, a lot of these, my thoughts and ideas aren't exactly original. I'm just drawing on my own personal experience and um, the work of uh, other authors and uh, people that, that uh, articulate oh, much more eloquently on these issues than I do. Two thoughts have emerged since I started this project. Uh, first thought has two parts. First part is, does the uh, black slave mind still persist and prevail in the year uh, 2019? I will say, and what I'm saying is, um, is the, the conditioning of the slave uh, still a major factor, a major player in the role of the majority of the black population, especially those descended from slaves. And that second part is, uh, conversely, does the white mind, the white master, the white entitlement, the white privilege, the white expectation of favor prevail and get passed on from generation to generation? Now, from my view, I look at it as uh, an issue of the navigating life and hurdles, you know, for me and maybe uh, many other black folks in America descended from slaves. We, uh, what we navigate, what I mean by navigate is uh, there's an absence of financial literacy. There's a, uh, an absence of um initiative. Um, there is the presence of a greater passivity um, for the black folks. And with those, just even those three elements, it's uh, it encumbers American life uh, when uh, the Constitution, other other institutions, other opportunities, uh, should negate all that. And the white folks, they, they don't navigate as far as is, uh, entitlement, initiative, um, pro being proactive. You know, they don't, uh, they're not encumbered by as many uh, barriers uh, to accessing American life. The only, well, there's two big indicators that I'd say. One is the, the incarceration rate, uh, how blacks bear uh, the majority of the dysfunction of the nation, and uh, economic indicators. More black folks are poor than white folks, and as the majority of black folks struggle, when the uh, black folks are a minority in the nation, uh, the, all the the, uh, the data tells a story. Um, <laughs> and it's too bad that well, too bad that black folks don't pay more attention. Um, I believe we feel it; it's apparent, but we don't respond properly. Having said that, that second ways into the second thought that's emerged in this uh, year-long project, as well, as well as it is that uh, back to the financial literacy issue. Um, it's financial literacy. It's it's um, how public education is more of a sabotage. It's not a um, it's not an in, public institution is not an institution 
public education is not an institution that enables um, a person to realize the American dream. We we are uh, conditioned in those classrooms over 13, 14 years, you know, um, we get, we, we learn to get symbols and we learn to be passive. We learn to, um, uh, trust the employer, get, uh, uh, shine ourselves up for the employer. So the employer will help us, aid us along. The information age actually has debunked that process, and I'm glad we, we moved. For I believe we're moving up beyond it. That's just where I come from. Um, so, but financial literacy, you know, uh, understanding entrepreneurship, uh, uh, making that the default, not defaulting into employment. Our self-employment. If you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki's um, arguments, you know he's got the cash flow quadrant. Go ahead and Google that, and you'll get an idea. And he's actually an extreme advocate about um, the failure of public education and how it ju it's just preparing us for failure and struggle. Uh, so those are my two thoughts. Uh, my fear, <laughs> see, my fear is that it, as uh, black folks or any group that is disenfranchised, marginalized, marginalized in America, as we get it together, uh, white power, entitlement, and privilege just raises the bar. It's just like, you yeah, know, Improving minimum wage. I don't. I don't even get excited about that anymore. I, 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 that ended a long time ago, anyway, because I realized they're just a, you raising minimum wage, and you're just raising prices. Inflation kicks in, uh, so it, it's <laughs> you know. I'm sure I don't. Know, I've never not done the research myself statistically, but if I look at the minimum wage today. The minimum wage yesterday, see the buying power is probably the same or has it maybe even gone down. <laughs> uh, but the masses, uneducated, uninformed, passive, are not uh, engaging material, not thinking critically. You know, I was there. Somehow I took the, the correct pill, like in the Matrix, I forget it's the blue or red. I took the, the one that woke me up and helped me to see the reality. I'm on fire and I'm motivated by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I read three of his works and um, I've never been able to look back. That was part of the, the pill. Might have been red. I forget. Uh, first book I read was uh, a black history reader 101 questions you never thought to ask we referenced these books heavily i encourage you to get them you can find the poweronomics.com or the heritage institute in washington dc will point you in the right direction black labor white wealth uh search for uh power and economic justice and dr anderson's plan to empower Black America, Poweronomics. Those materials are dated, but it doesn't matter. We're talking hundreds of years of slavery, conditioning, uh, purposeful um, employing purposeful devices against uh, a specific group of people. A specific group of people employed these devices to keep uh, us black folks locked in. We take a uh, fictional look uh, after we get done uh, the series on the signers of the Declaration of Independence. We'll revisit Uncle Tom, uh, see how he's getting on. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe.
came out in mid eighteen hundreds. Very important work, I believe, it influenced theaters, stereotypes between blacks and whites, people, and all that stuff. We'll chime in. We see how slave owners, slave traders, uh, black folks, uh, slaves, and all that are getting along in the mid eighteen hundreds. Behind me, you see hashtag us too. Response to the hashtag Me Too movement. This is essentially black women getting together. Hashtag Me Too is white women. Uh, issues about sexuality, freedom, expression, uh, having a voice, and whatnot. Uh, go check them out. You know, I, I support what they're about. Uh, also, Black Enough, B L A G G E N U F. Uh, it's kind of a black Facebook hangout there. That's the information age. If you found me here on YouTube, uh, you can find your flavor. I just encourage you to do your own critical thinking, disagree, and uh, find your own um, support, your own voice. You know, I'm just one guy among billions. You know, having to be a man, black, uh, a little older now. <laughs> I like wearing hats and hoodies. <laughs> you know, you could be white or so female, uh, uh, with tattoos, you know. <laughs> God bless. Here we go. Okay, we are uh, still going through our uh, the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, moving right through, you know, 56 signers, we do two a day, going to have 28 entries, and we're in the H's, a lot of H's in here, and uh, that's probably the most represented last name, the H's in there, that might be a study in that, we'll, we'll see. First uh, gentleman up is uh, Thomas Hayward, Jr., born 1746, died 1809. His story, these are mock interviews, of course. Uh, his story uh, kind of centers around South Carolina. He's a lawyer and plantation owner. This, this might be the first, you know, everybody probably dabbled in something. Um, it, as time goes on, you see people needing to specialize and diverge from um uh, from being so global in their um, talents, you know, because um, schools are limited and stuff like that. So you're, you're getting this well-rounded education that that puts you in um, in those circles. So uh, we shouldn't be surprised to see a lawyer and a plantation owner. But I will say, as we've gone through this series alphabetically, a lawyers and positions that those um, tra uh, trades I consider more oh humane um, not as blue collar ish um, were one camp and then your plantation owners and merchants are um, another camp here we've got the merging of the two I think this is the first lawyer plantation white collar, blue collar thing going on. Now I say plantation or blue collar, uh, uh, he probably didn't do the hands work because since he's a plantation owner, guess what? He owns slaves. We're going to just suppose that it didn't come out uh, overtly in the, um, in the uh, study and the research but you hear plantation, you suppose slavery is involved. Uh, South Carolina judge, 1778, studied law in England for a time, came back, and he was, um, you know, even with his English ties, English schooling, he came back and was still motivated to um, be a patriot and represent South Carolina at the Continental Congress. Um, he was um, arrested in 1780 
by the British and um, both today's signers have some uh, issue uh, with the British and we'll see geographically how that works um, and uh, this guy's from South Carolina next guy's going to be from North Carolina uh, but the, the South Carolina gentleman uh, Judge uh, Thomas Hayward Jr. He was actually arrested by the British. And you got to think, these guys are facing, you know, they're doing treasonous work. Um, so he, he's, he didn't get a, a killed, um, you know, didn't get assassinated or um, summarily executed. Uh, he, he was um, fortunate in that regard. Um, I guess he was um, released at some point. Uh, the, your brief notes probably have more of that information. Um, so slavery, he was just um, South Carolina born. Uh, he's in the South. Slavery's an institution. You know, no, um, no impact on his life. He's got no religion. He's not, he's not registered. Episcopalian congregation, deist, anything like that, Quaker. I just, there's just no religion associated with him. I'm sure he had some uh, exposure, um, but we could not grill him on how his relationship with God, or religion, impacted his relation with slavery. Um, with slavery being an institution, um, and that there's no religion associated with his activities that's just going to compound and exacerbate, I believe, uh, the problem with treating another human being who happens to be a darker skin color. Um, he's going to, everything's white and right in his world. Um, he signed economical reasons more so. Uh, plantation owner, all the merchants and plantation owners are going to argue that England is taking more than their fair share uh, of the goods. You know, I would, that would be my argument. I want to keep, you know, it's my, my wealth, my success it is dependent on how much of this I can keep. And those crops, the labor and all that, that's my, I'm having ownership. That's mine, leave it alone, hands off. Um, so I'm guessing he had extreme economic reasons as England kept uh, encroaching on his uh, economic rights and his growth uh, was a challenge. You know, a lot of these men were, were considered wealthy in the research but it doesn't matter, you know. You're talking greed, you're talking a sense of ownership, entitlement, and stuff, you know. Don't, I don't even want to hear that you're thinking of introducing another tax, some other thing. I'm not being represented, you know. I'm going through that right now, uh, personally, with the, the present government, you know. Um, <laughs> I can't get a word in edgewise, I'm not big enough. Um, I, I don't command, uh, you know, resources. Um, I don't, uh, I don't rule or I'm not, I don't have leadership over a large community of people. You know, I'm a little guy. Um, uh, so, you know, I can, I can understand how these men felt, how anyone would feel, how the slaves felt. You know, being shuffled around, raped, and, and whipped and stuff, but having my will um, disregarded, you know, is just how uh, power and power structure works against the vulnerable and the weak, you know. Uh, so that's uh, Thomas Hayward Jr., South Carolina. William Hooper, 17, 
42 to 17. 90 is our next uh, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Now, here's another northern boy, Yankee, uh, that kind of found his way down to North Carolina. I didn't get much into the convoluted story. Go to Wikipedia, and you'll, um, I think it does mention how he found his way down there to be a North Carolina lawyer. And um, we have, uh, his life is pretty active. Um, we find him vacillating between loyalist and patriot uh, allegiances. Um, it should not be surprising that you find, you'll find people that who are on the cusp as transitioning is happening. Uh, debates and arguments need to happen, and, you know, people, I'm sure people cross alliances a lot of times. For him, somehow he became uh, apparently visible, and he, uh, you know, was one of those guys on the fence. And so sometimes he's leaning this way, sometimes that way, and, but it caused problems with the growing, um, support of patriotism caused problems for him in being, uh, you know, in him navigating his story, wherever he was trying to go, what he was trying to do with his life it was very problematic and, and cumbersome. You know, he probably had to prove himself often in his allegiances, what he was trying to do, what he wanted to do, who he wanted to be um, in the colonies once he made that firm decision uh, to be on the sides of the Patriots. He was a uh, son of, a, of an Episcopal minister, so uh, hopefully, let's see if we have any impact on his view of slavery and, um, and whatnot, which um, we find, we don't find much, find him very apathetic. Because uh, down in North Carolina, he was on the run for a little bit. He was separated from his family. Uh, the British were after him, and wanted to uh, chase him. So I'm sure there was a lot of cloak and dagger, fly by night uh, issues uh, with him um, trying to uh, evade capture and whatnot. It appears he wasn't. He was never captured, but it left him kind of in a, a homeless state. He relied on family and friends. You know, what I'm saying is his, he had his priorities were self-preservation, his family, and then the nation. You know, so, so slavery was not very high on his list, and even though he's in the slave colony, a slave state, supporting that and whatnot. Other issues and priorities came before. And th this is a systemic, even to this day, every, what, what the problem is, one of the reasons I'm here is because the, the black issue is not a priority. Um, will we get enough, uh, uh, resources to kind of keep up and, uh, every once in a while, our superstars will um, have a meteoric rise uh, to the top, um, either through sports, you know, all the entertainment, um, uh, ways to climb, you know, sports, game shows, talk shows, and the like. Uh, you rarely hear about the doctors. We, there's a black man as a Supreme Court justice, although people don't count him as, as a super advocate once, uh, and this is, this is my fear, the danger to any uh, marginalized, disenfranchised group is that as individuals from those sectors rise up, they tend to forget 
So anyway, it's it's priorities, priorities. So uh, William Hooper Bill is um, he's just on the run. There's a lot of drama in his life. He's tired. Um, uh, after the war, he, he he was just tired. So his he the the patriot community felt he was too soft on loyalists. He's he's, re, he's he's having a loyalist loyalist relapse and whatnot. So he, he had to struggle. Seems like he had to struggle with defining and affirming his allegiances uh, for the, the uh, you know for the balance of his life and whatnot. Episcopalian, you know, they've got a bishop. There's some church church organization. There's procedure. Uh, during church services, I was I was in a Episcopalian flavored church, you know, with offerings and uh, order of service and stuff like that. Very, uh, very important to the Episcopalians. Uh, no time for slaves is, um, which we shouldn't be surprised. The guy's running for his life often. <laughs> uh, so just too much drama. I believe he signed uh, just for personal peace. You know, I'm sure different areas of the colonies had their various points of stress. You know, up north, you had tea parties, massacres, a lot of involvement. Uh, William Hooper is on the run. And all that, so you know, it's either fight or flight. You want to work towards and for anything that's going to get get us get get into a position of peace. I'm going. I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm in the middle of two years of peace. You know, it took me decades to get to this point whether it's from my own shortcomings, drugs and alcohol, or um, external environmental pressures and whatnot, being black um, can have it and does have its limitations in America, you know. So I got, ugh, got my elbows out. I need this two years and my, my head does there's different creative things happening for me going back to school, you know, uh, you know, and the price. There, there's some there's some trade offs, you know. I'm not as mobile as I'd like to be. Maybe I'm not as uh, involved with the black community. I, I really never have been. Uh, you know, we can talk personally. Go ahead, email me. Uh, do, do some kind of like or uh, comment and I'll try to interact with you the best I can. I have, this is a private, uh, I'm glad you hear these videos are public, but they go out to a private email list. Um, so, but it's not impossible for us to connect. Um, I have, people that may know each other on the list, but for the most part, uh, most people, for the most part, they don't know, the people on my list, that my short list, don't know each other. So if, well, I'm saying that all to say, if you do interact with me, it'll be privately. And uh, I'm not, sure, I've not thought about how to develop this into more of a community interaction. I'm not sure I want that. I don't like. I don't like what goes on with um, with emails and stuff. I, something I give you my email, and I'm getting all kinds of crazy sexual and and, and uh, all kinds of crazy emails in my inbox. I got to put the junk mail. Yeah, you know that this internet thing. It's a, the, the potential is so great, but there's just so much greed and 
uh, immorality in there that that makes me uh, back up. But there you go. Uh, I'm about to run over here. I don't want to do that. Thomas Hayward Jr. and William Hooper were our next two guys. Seem to have some drama in there. The one captured by the British, one running from the British, and, and all this stuff. Uh, let's tune in. We still got a long way to go. We got, I think, it goes up to W's. <laughs> and then we'll wrap it up and get into some other stuff. But I think it's important. We want to know uh, some of the thought behind the men who framed uh, this incredible nation. I think it's important. I promise we will only go through it once <laughs> in uh, this year. I'm Tom Nyback. Thanks for hanging out with me at 365 Days Towards Racial Change. I'll see you tomorrow.